Aloha, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to live Q&A here on Trauma Recovery University. I'm your host, Athena Moberg, and as you know, or maybe you don't know, maybe you're new here tonight, our co-host, our, our usual co-host, Bobby Parrish, is on vacation, and she is in the UK, and so we have a special guest with us tonight. Um, first of all, I just want to welcome you super fast. Like, if you're brand new to this channel and you're not sure who I am and if you're in the right place, I am Athena Moberg. I'm an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse, and I show up here every week with my amazing co-host, Bobby Parrish, and we are here to serve the global community of adult survivors of child abuse, specifically childhood sexual abuse. And we do that by coming here and doing live Q&A every Monday. 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, and you, the survivors or survivor supporters, show up here on this YouTube channel or Roku TV channel or podcast, and you listen along or you send your questions or you send your tweets or you're over on YouTube or you're in a live chat box or you're sending us emails, and we answer your questions. All of our topics are chosen by you, the community. And we show up here every week to answer your questions and provide honest dialogue and education and support that is trauma-informed so that you, the adult survivor of child abuse, will have everything you need for healthy, informed trauma recovery. So that's who I am. And if that's you, you're in the right place. Every week we have a different topic. And this week's topic is special because it is for the spouses, and the supporters or partners of adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. So in honor of that, we have a very special guest host here with us tonight. Her name is Heather Tuba, and she is an advocate. She is a survivor advocate, and she is a spouse of an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse. So um, we have uh, just some really important um, tips and strategies to share with you tonight, and I also have a very special sort of cameo spotlight brief share that I'm going to share with all of you by some of our community members that have been married for 18 years as well, and they are both survivors, two spouses that are survivors, and they've been married for 18 years, and I have some helpful bullet points for you, the survivor or spouse, if either if you're in a marriage and you both are survivors. So um, kind of a, a full episode tonight, and all of it is in honor of the spouses and partners of us, the survivor community. So I'm super grateful that you guys have chosen to spend this hour with us. I love that you're here. We have an entire community of survivors that are over on the Twitter feed. If you are here live and you're tuning in and you're finding us on YouTube or Google+, Plus. Um, I would love for you to head on over to Twitter or over in the chat box. You can type in your questions or comments. And if this is your first time with us, welcome, welcome, welcome. Before we get started, I just want to issue a trigger warning. What that means is that if you live with post-traumatic stress disorder or some sort of developmental trauma due to childhood abuse or any side, uh, sort of childhood trauma, then the topics of conversation that we have during tonight's episode could be very triggering for your trauma. We will be discussing childhood abuse, sometimes childhood sexual abuse. There are very honest and raw and real stories that we share here. We have very real and raw questions that come in from you, the community members, that are asked to me, and then I'm answering, and I'm going to be turning it over to Heather, who's our guest co-host tonight, and just, if you get triggered during this broadcast, we ask kindly that you do not seek help on the hashtag no more shame. That's not where you're going to receive. You're going to receive great support from our community because our community is right there on the hashtag to say hi and we love you and we'll sit with you through this and send you virtual hugs and support. But professional care, trauma-informed care is what we want for you to receive. And for you to get the proper care that you deserve, we need you to reach out to someone who is trauma-informed, someone who's set up for crisis care. 
because we here at Trauma Recovery University, we are not crisis care. We are here to educate and inform and inspire and sit with you and share some laughs and some cries, but we're not set up for crisis support. So in order for you to get the care that you need, I'm going to give you some information right now. And if you are not tuning in live, by the way, and you're on a replay, thank you so much for being here. Down below this video in the description, second, description section, just before you get to the comments, there's a number. And you can click that number and fast forward directly to the one page content and you won't have to listen to everybody's questions. Um, sometimes we get some comments or some trolls or they get irritated like, shut up already and quit talking. You know, they're, they're not here participating live and they're brand new. So if that's you, no need to be nasty. Just click the number and you'll fast forward if you're on a replay. We're not here to annoy you. We're here to serve this community and this is how we do it. So if you are triggered during this broadcast, you may head over to RAIN, our friends over at RAIN. That's a Rape Abuse Incest National Network. That's R-A-I-N-N dot org. And if you, that's if you're in the United States. They have a great 24-7 live chat feature on their website. You can also reach them by telephone if you prefer to speak with someone like a live person in, in, uh, with your voice. And you can reach them in the U.S. by dialing 1-800-656-HOPE, H-O-P-E. Now, our friends over at one in org are there for the male survivor community. We have a lot more male survivors that have been here every single week. I get emails from them. The number of men that are subscribing to this channel is increasing by the day. So we're so grateful to be a source of support to the male survivor community. Head over to oneinsix.org. They also have an amazing live chat feature on their website. It's actually a similar software as our friends over at Rain. If you are in Canada, I know the Gatehouse is an awesome source of support, and then I'll ask Heather to share in a little bit some, some resources that are in Canada where she's located as well. If you're in the UK, you can reach out to the Samaritans over at, the Samarit over at Samaritans.org, or you can email one of their staff members, joe, J-O, at Samaritans.org. They provide help through email and... They're just awesome. They're just amazing, caring, loving people, our friends over at Samaritans. So if you're listening on a podcast platform, this is a video broadcast. Please go to our Roku TV channel or our YouTube channel and search your channel directory for Trauma Recovery University. As always, this week and every single other week, we have 160, I believe, 160. 160 videos? I'm not sure. It's over 100 and it's less than 200. But each of them has a one-page downloadable resource for you, the adult survivor, or for tonight, the supporter or spouse or partner of an adult survivor of child abuse. You can get complimentary access to all of our one-page downloadable resources by going to one of our websites and looking for a tab that says downloadables. Now, you can go to nomoreshameproject.com. You can go to traumarecoveryuniversity.com. Um, you can find me or Bobby L. Parrish over on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook at Trauma Recovery University. You can find us on Twitter at Trauma Recovery U. There's links everywhere. All you have to do is look for the tab that says downloadables on one of our websites, and you'll be given immediate access to not only tonight's downloadable one-page resource, but our entire library. Now there are over 200 hours of videos here on this YouTube channel, on this Roku TV channel, and we're so excited that you've decided to spend some time with us tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to read the bio of our guest co-host tonight, Heather Tuba. And um, I would love for you guys to say hi to her over on Twitter. Um, you can find her on Twitter at Heather Tuba, or please check out her blog and subscribe for updates on HeatherTuba.com. Again, she's a survivor advocate, and she's just an overall awesome human. So I'm going to find her bio really quick here and read it to you. Where did I put Heather's bio? I know it's here somewhere. Oh my goodness. I have it here. Right when you think you have it ready, 
If you're listening on a podcast, my apologies. Here we go. Um, there we go, you guys. All right. So I will do a little screen share here for you guys. Okay, please welcome our guest co-host, Heather Tuba, on the topic of spouses and supporters of childhood sexual abuse survivors. Heather writes, speaks, and advocates on behalf of childhood abuse survivors and their families, especially childhood sexual abuse. Her topics include education on the damage of childhood abuse, ways to create safety and support survivors, partners and spouses and families and insights gained from her experience as the spouse of a childhood abuse survivor. She has over 20 years experience working in mental health as a coach, mentor, and facilitator. You can find her writing at heathertuba.com. You can find her on Twitter at heathertuba or at fa on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash heathertuba. Heather and her husband have been married She's been married to the love of her life for 26 years, and they have three beautiful daughters. So I'm so excited to um, introduce Heather to you guys. If you were here um, this morning for hashtag CSAQT, which stands for Childhood Sexual Abuse Question Time, Heather was our guest host this morning with our friend Jody Betty, who was moderating. So we have three Twitter chats per week in this community. The first one is CSAQT and that is at 6 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time in the UK. And then this one, the second one, hashtag no more shame, and that's 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern here in the UK, here with the live video. And the third one is tomorrow on Tuesdays, the original sex abuse chat with Rachel Thompson and our very own Bobby Parrish. But without further, to, further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Heather Tuba and just ask her to just share from her heart a little bit about um, her journey as being um, an advocate and the spouse of an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And if you have questions for Heather on any topic regarding spouses um, or sp spouses and supporters of childhood sexual abuse, please go ahead and tweet those using the hashtag no more shame um, or use the live chat feature if you happen to be here live. So I'm gonna hand this over to Heather. Please help me welcome Heather Tuba. Welcome Heather. Thanks, Athena. Um, I just wanted to say I'm so excited to be here. It's such a pleasure to be a part of this community. I actually haven't been um, with you guys very long, but from the start, all of you made me feel so welcome. And um, I was just every, the last few weeks, I've only been hanging out for about five or six weeks, I think. But I just looked forward to it every week. And even though I'm not a survivor myself, I found this great supportive community. And I think I wanted to say that because, you know, there's not a lot of resources for spouses and partners and families. In fact, I heard someone say it's there is a dearth of resources. And I thought, wow, that's really the truth. There is just this deep well of nothing. And I, I've looked and I've tried to connect with other large organizations to find out what's, what's what, and I haven't found anything. But so the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think spouses and partners can benefit from sitting in on online communities like um, the No More Shame Project. I have felt supported by you guys and I'm not a survivor. And I think connecting with communities like the one here is a great way to, to find community, even if you're not a survivor, but you are involved in a um, intimate, close relationship with a survivor. So I just wanted to say thank you to Athena and Bobby for welcoming me into the fold. And I want to say hello to, to 
all of you that I've really grown to care about. And uh, I also wanted to just give a big thank you to my husband, uh, Derek Tuba, who really is the love of my life. And I don't want to get all teary here, but I might. <laughs> Um, that's okay. We cry a lot on this channel. <laughs> and then you end up laughing and passing the cookies. So it's who has good. given me permission to go public with our story and my story? And I know the I know the courage it takes to talk about abuse. And I just want to say thank you to him because he has been my biggest supporter just as I've been his supporter and um, so I just want to say thank you to him he's awesome oh well that's awesome I'm I'm really grateful to Derek as well for just being open and um, just just first of all for him being brave and just delving through delving into the recovery journey the way that he has and you have been his supporter along his alongside him and you mm -hmm. have you shared this morning during chat something that was super super key and I really before we do have a one one page like I mentioned earlier you guys you can get access to the one page downloadable by going to one of our websites either no more shame project.com or trauma recovery university.com and then find a tab that says downloadables but Heather you mentioned something really key this morning that I want it's I feel like it's sort of the undercurrent of this broadcast and that is you mentioned spouses and supporters taking the time to do research and learn about trauma. Can you please speak to that and speak to the importance of that? If they take away nothing else from this video and they tune mm -hmm. out 15, 20 minutes in, I just, I would love for, for anyone to walk away and know that that was what I took away from chat this morning, that the most important thing other than listening and saying, I believe you, is that they take the time to do the research. So could you share on that for a little bit while I while I get some questions from some yeah, viewers sure. right now? Yeah, if I were to say the number one thing that has saved me and I believe has saved my marriage and has been uh, been been a willingness to learn and to get education on the topic of childhood abuse and I want to say first off that you don't have to be a therapist you don't have to take have taken psychology you don't have to have taken you know um, anatomy and physiology to understand the basics of of trauma and by trauma I'm talking about childhood childhood abuse um, I think there is a I, I was thinking about this today actually Athena and what came to mind is whether you're a person of faith or not um, one thing I really believe is getting under there's a proverb that says get wisdom and get understanding and for me getting understanding has been the number one thing I've done that has saved me understanding the underlying physiological and relational and psychological issues of your survivor spouse or partner is probably the best thing that you can do and it's not just for them it's also for you because it will help you not to take things personally it will help you as the spouse and partner to understand what you are dealing with and I liken it to um, the spouse or partner of somebody has <clears throat> who has um, a life-threatening illness and to be honest having a diagnosis of complex PTSD PTSD or other issues or other diagnoses that come can come not always but that can come with childhood abuse 
they are light they are life threatening and so i think of it as if your partner spouse had a life threatening illness what would you do what would you do and you would want to learn you would want to understand you would want to get all the information you could so that you could be the most informed person and person for that partner and you want to be the an informed partner spouse it's good for your mental health it's good for your relationship it's good for the mental health of the survivor um, and like I said, I, you don't have to be a specialist to, to understand the basics of this. One of the most crucial things I learned in this journey, and it, it wasn't that last long ago, it actually happened um, early this year, um, was I, I, I just understood that what my husband and I were dealing with was a physiological brain injury. And that one piece of information, it was like that huge aha moment that we, we have. And understanding that has really just helped me to keep going on this journey. Understanding that what we're actually dealing with has, is, is in the brain. And it's an injury. It's an invisible injury, but it is, it is nonetheless an injury. And so that's the number one thing I will say is, right, aside from the I believe you listening, uh, showing compassion, respect, and dignity is the education component. And, um, you know, I read a few key books that helped me with this. Um, I can provide the names of those after. Um, but basically, you know, that's, that's one of my messages this is an injury there is physiology involved this is what you are dealing with and becoming informed on this will save you <clears throat> thank you so much any thoughts Heather. on that athena yeah. any... no absolutely i i really wanted you to drive that home because mm -hmm. i don't think that it can be said enough that <laughs> we don't know we, we don't make this stuff up. Like we're not, no. I mean, at the risk of sounding very flippant and rude and sarcastic, I really need for anyone watching this who is not a survivor, like we don't just have meltdowns for funsies. Like we don't just wake up on a random Tuesday and go, I know what I'll do. I'll have a complete total meltdown today. That sounds like a lot of fun. I know, I'll lose it completely in the produce aisle of the grocery store. Oh, I know, I'll have an anxiety attack in my car, hyperventilate while I'm on my way into the store, and then freeze up completely when the gal at the cash register asks me for my credit card. Yeah, that's not really what's on our agenda. We don't really mm -hmm. lose it on purpose. Like, and we don't, we don't secretly sit back and go, hmm, I know what I'll do. I'll keep all my memories a secret from everyone I know, and then at the least opportune time, I'll share them with my spouse, the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. That's right. what I'll do. Yeah. No, like our memories come to us when they come to us. Uh, trauma is cumulative. Something will happen in the present, in the now, and it will trigger one, two, five, 10, 30, 40, 50, other things that happened a long time ago that happened to be traumatic. It's just the nature of trauma. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. for the way you stated the fact that it's, it's, it's a trauma, it's an injury. And we don't, like, I remember Bobby, Bobby has a the good example of <clears throat> like di diabetics, you know, like for instance, my husband comes from a family where people, they don't take, like they don't take medicine, mm. they, they take vitamins. But um, but they don't believe in medicine. They just don't. It's just not something they believe in. So I'm super glad that none of them have like diabetes and eat insulin or, you know, and maybe they did, but they died because they didn't get the medicine they wanted because they don't believe in medicine. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, unfortunately, one of um, my, my brother-in-law actually 
um, recently just had surgery and and is having some medical things going on right now and and he's in recovery and he's doing well but like my husband for instance when I told him what was going on with me and I told him that my general practitioner my doctor um, said that maybe I should go speak with someone in behavioral medicine and like meet with like a psychiatrist or something he goes oh yeah you don't want to do that they're just gonna put you on a bunch of pills you don't need that. You're fine. You're doing great. And I'm like, how the F do you know I'm doing great? Like, do you know that it's a struggle to get out of bed some days? Do you know that I haven't left the house in like two weeks because I have this little voice inside my head that tells me if I leave my house, I'm going to have like a flashback or I'm not going to be able to keep it together. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I'm super duper duper doing just fine. You're right. I don't need help. Like, so there's, like I have that, I have that struggle with him. Like I feel, I I have to share with him it, when I'm calmed down. Um, honey, I feel judged by you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm not judging you at all. Hmm. I still feel judged by you. I know it's not your intention to judge me, but when you say things like "You're fine. You don't need to go to the doctor. They're going to just put you on some pills," I feel judged by you. What if I do need some pills? Am I not good enough to be your wife anymore? Am I not good enough to be your wife anymore because I have a mental illness due to being sexually abused for long periods of time and sexually exploited and sold and traded for things when I was a child by my family members? So does that disqualify me? I'm sorry. I'm too messed up to be your spouse. Thanks. I feel judged by you. Like my poor husband who grew up in a leave it to beaver household, please pass the sugar. Yes, ma'am. Here you go. I love you, we eat dinner and breakfast together every single day. Never once did my husband miss an evening meal in like 20 years. I don't think he ever missed an evening meal. And he ate breakfast with his family every morning as well. And every summer they went camping together for three months and went to national parks and they all camped together in the same camper. Like they all like each other. There isn't sexual abuse in his family. There just isn't. It's like a foreign concept to him. So. When he says things like, I think you're fine. You don't need to go to the doctor. And I'm like, you know, here are the voices in my head telling me that I'll never be enough and that I'm disgusting and that I'm gross. And then my family members' voices that are playing on top of those right. voices that are telling me that I'm annoying and I am unwanted and I should have never been born. And you're so stupid and you're clumsy and you're fat. And you're this and you're, I mean, just all these other voices. Like, uh, I need my spouse to go, well, if your doctor says that perhaps you should seek some help, how do you feel about that? How can I best support you? How can I be a source of support for you? Thank you for asking. Wow, that's amazing. Like, I don't, I don't get that. I didn't get that response. Like now my husband's reading a book by Dr. Dan Allender, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's taken five and a half years, you guys. This doesn't happen overnight. So if you take nothing away from this broadcast, please don't say anything that will cause your survivor spouse to feel judged because they are already judging themselves. And they already feel shame on top of shame on top of shame. And oh my gosh. So anyway, that was a little bit of a rant. Um, sorry, I do that. Like you've been here, you do that. I want to say hello. You've been here enough to know that I go on the rant. So um, and you agreed to be you agreed to be here. <laughs> um, I have some questions. <laughs> I have some Go questions. ahead. I have some questions for some people. Um, I wanna first of all um say um welcome 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 to jj J it's jj's very first time being here live with us um jj spent all day watching previous broadcasts and is here live for the very oh. first time so if everybody cool. could just say hello to at jj strong one zero on twitter that would be amazing um and then everybody else is saying hello hello hi destiny hi don hi maggie i'm saying hi to maggie in a new place and I'm saying hi to Lizzie. Um, and Lizzie is the one who had some excellent questions. Okay, so Lizzie says, I have, a, Lizzie has a couple questions. I have a friend that by accident will scare me. 
What do I say to him to let him know that it's not his fault? Um, this isn't a, um, a spouse that's scaring Lizzie, but it's someone. And But that, that would be a really good question. If you'd like to answer that briefly, and I'll go back to a couple of the other questions that were asked. I believe it was by Carrie. Yes, I have two questions from Carrie, but Lizzie asks a great question. Like if someone okay. is, like I get startled easily as well. Like when my husband puts his cup down on the, on the counter. I don't know what, what your friend is doing to scare you, Lizzie, but my husband does the same thing and it's super duper on accident. It's not purposely like mean, like I know I'm gonna just scare her right now. Um, Heather, what would you say to anyone out there that is that that is the um, recipient of someone's trauma response? <laughs> Right. Um, I would say that, um, you know, being startled, uh, being hypervigilant, having um, heightened star their startle responses is, is normal for uh, trauma survivors as they're recovering. You know, I would use it as an opportunity to provide education for your friend because I think any opportunity that that you as survivors have to educate your supporters is super important so you know really depending on your level of disclosure uh, openness the level of intimacy in the relationship it might be a great time to sit down and say as you're aware I have such and such from my background and because of the trauma of my past it causes uh, my body to respond to over respond and this has nothing to do with you. It's a physiological response that my body has to loud noises or or whatever. Um, you know, I can be a bit skittish or, or jumpy. And, you know, I just wanted to let you know why that is. Um, and if I jump or I let out a yelp, it's it's not because of you. It's just simply because I'm I'm recovering from this. and. You know, I hope it's the type of relationship will, will you, where you will be able to say those kind of things. I mean, that would ultimately, for me, be a great relationship where you could have those kind of dialogues where as things come up that seem out of the realm of normal, that you could take those opportunities to provide some information to your, like, I think this works really well with friends you know close friends or you know people in your you know your close sphere that 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 might see some of the um you know might see some of the responses that are are out of the realm of of normal but are nonetheless a result of of being a vict uh, being a survivor Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, I just sent Lizzie a message just asking her, letting her know that you were answering her question on oh, video. Okay. And then just to like let us know if your answer is helpful. I, I, mm -hmm. I think your answer is very helpful and that's really great advice as well. Um, would it be all right, Heather, if I asked you a couple of questions really quick that were sent in a, um, earlier from a gal named Carrie? Could I just give one more point, just sort of segueing off that last one? Of course, absolutely. Well, on another note, I think it's also um, important for survivors that, to become informed about the trauma and the responses, you know, what it does on a physiological level as well. So I think both parties in a relationship are responsible to seek out the education and the information about about the condition, so I just want to I just want it don't want to make it seem like it's all on the partner spouse. It 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 has to be a joint effort. I would agree. I would agree a hundred percent. I actually approached that with like a presupposition as though the survivor already did all their research, but like I wasn't always in that discovery phase, right? Like there are phases that we go through in our recovery where 
we're all about discovering like what this is, et cetera. And even Dominique tonight on our broadcast, mm -hmm. I CC'd you on a tweet that I sent to her because she said physiological brain injury. Oh my gosh, that is a light bulb moment for me. Just yep, that yep. phrase. And and there were times a in, moment for me too. Yeah, me too. There were times <laughs> I've probably done way more reading on trauma and stuff than my husband, to be honest, because you know, the, the recovery road is grueling and it takes a lot out of, out of, out of survivors. And I have no idea what that's like because I'm not one, but you know, he, he has been really good about when he has the energy about taking responsibility. But sometimes I'll be honest, sometimes it's a bit of a fight because I'm like, well, I'm reading this and I'm reading that and da da da. And, but you know, I, I, I recognize that recovery is a grueling and arduous process and it, it, there, it ebbs and flows. And you know, for us, I'm always reading and stuff and I'm always slipping my husband information. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know he does not read it all, but he does. I do wish best. that my husband would read everything that I send him. Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> I mean, I have, I have binge watched every channel I can find on childhood sexual abuse, like for the last three years. I mean, three years ago, just to give, just to, Heather, <laughs> Heather, Heather, to give you an idea. I know some of you all bear with, bear with me as I bore you, like, cause some of you that are here every week know this already, but, <laughs> but Heather, three years ago this week, there was a piece of paper up on my wall in my living room that was shaped like a tree. Okay. That was Christmas. Cause I couldn't function to I could barely get out of bed let alone think about like how to decorate a tree or and and I do want to say this Heather and this could maybe you could speak to this a little bit after we answer Carrie's question yes, yes, yep. the reason I was so non-functioning is because I was still in daily contact with my abuser mm. <sighs> That's a deep well that we will probably never reach the bottom of if we were to try to to discuss the the possibilities and the implications of what can happen to you psychologically, yes, what happens yes. to your psyche if you are in daily contact with someone who is predatory and seeking to destroy you. Um, not a good not a good choice on my part, but I didn't know. I, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, so, for sure. Um, it took me 10 months from that date to actually get the courage up. I slowly went low, 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 low contact. It took me 10 months almost to the day from, from then to realize, okay, I, I can't. I can't do this anymore. I just, I won't survive. I will complete my suicide attempt if I stay in contact with this person. I just, I will. So, um, yeah, boundaries. Like you said something during chat. Was it today? I think it was today. You said, my boundaries have gotten really, really, really good since, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can speak on that in a minute. If you, Do you want to do the questions yeah. first? I, will, I just okay. want to answer Carrie's question because it, yeah, for um, sure. and we could talk all night about any one of these <laughs> questions. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah. Because this, I mean, just this topic in general, you guys, I mean, just, okay, first of all, the thought of having someone who's an advocate and a supporter, like having a spouse or a supporter or someone that actually is advocating or cares enough, that's like a novel concept. Like not all of us even have that. Like I never had that previously and I have that now, but like, I mean, it's been, a, it's been five years or so because I didn't know how to communicate my needs to saying, I need you to read this. I need you to understand. So we could talk about any of these questions all night, so I'll just try to keep it brief. But Carrie says this, Heather. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about how partners and spouses can feel a strong need to protect, defend, and settle the scores for their survivor? This can cause my husband, Steve, a lot of anxiety and he doesn't know what to do with those feelings. 
So you have the you have the spouse who's like, let me at him. I'm gonna set I'm gonna settle the score. I almost like wish that that was like how my spouse would respond, but there was none of that going on. It was just kind of like okay. It's like, are you in there? Like, did you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. <laughs> give know? me something. Yeah, give me something. But like, you know, he but again, that just I mean, everybody has a different type of response and like how they respond to difficult, painful news and not everybody emotes. Men yeah. Sometimes do not emote. And that tends to be the case, I guess. Like with my husband specifically. But um yeah. would you would you please um share a little bit about any experience you have or any advice you have to a spouse or supporter that has a deep need to want to settle the score or protect or defend um, and maybe perhaps how to do this in a way that will not cause her survivor spouse any added anxiety. Right, right. Um, I think that is a natural response. Uh, re those are natural thoughts. It's normal for your thoughts to go to seeking retribution for the grief that the abusers have caused because both of you are suffering. It's, it's not just the survivor that's suffering, it's the partner spouse that's suffering. Everybody, we're, we're suffering because of something that was done often decades earlier. Um, one thing that I have just always had an internal sense about kind of gauging where my husband is at, even as I, I'll talk about launching this website and going more public with the story. Um, you know, I, I, I probably had about six months previous to launching the website, which I only did it this past September, where I just was really mulling things over and, and kind of thinking about how I would do this. And, you know, as it got closer to the time when I was going to launch, uh, Derek and I talked about it. But at first, you know, I didn't want to say who, all I said was I'm supporting a loved one through their recovery journey from childhood abuse. That's all I said. And then, you know, as, as time went by, I would just, I would start to kind of gauge Derek's comfort level. Um, you know, I would gauge my comfort level, like how much disclosure is, is too much disclosure. I think that's always a question as a spouse and partner that we want to ask and be aware of. And I'm, I honestly, Derek and I didn't talk about it that much, but as, you know, it was almost like just this understanding we had about when it was appropriate to say the next thing. So now I'm now, now today I'm on this chat talking about this pretty openly, but there's certain circles I won't talk about it or I'll, I, I, I just won't talk about it. Um, the need to get revenge, I, I, for lack of a better word, revenge. I think expressing your anger as a spouse through journaling, through if you're by yourself and you want to rage about it, I, I'm actually all for it because you need, or, or in a therapy office or with a safe person, you know, you're going to have strong feelings and you're going to have to face those feelings. There's a lot of anger, there's confusion, there's fear, there's anxiety, um, there's feelings unsafety that spouses and partners um, experience. And you know, learning how to um, acknowledge them, validate them, and then deal with them in healthy in a healthy manner is so important. Um, yeah, so those are all things that I do that I found helpful. Thank and, you so uh, much yeah. for sharing that. I think that's real. I think that's really really helpful. Um, I found myself during chat this morning thinking to myself, I know that this is like trauma recovery 101 and 
like mm. never compare your own journey to somebody else's because it will just, I mean, there's nothing good that can come of that. But like, I was thinking to myself, like my husband never cried. Like I almost like, not that I want to see my husband cry because I have seen him cry previously and it is, it's just heartbreaking and, and it makes me want to, I just want to just comfort him. But like, I've seen him cry over things about like his parents or whatever, but when I shared something that was like devastating, you know, and like soul crushing, there was just like no emotion. And I, I almost was like comparing myself and my spouse to somebody else's spouse this morning going, well, if my husband really loved me, he would have responded the mm -hmm. same way that person's spouse responded. And that's such a wrong attitude for me, the survivor, like my poor husband. But like, I mean, I had to sit with that feeling for a yeah. while. I was, I, it was natural for me to feel that way in that moment. And I had to sit with that and go, why am I feeling like this? Is it really that my husband doesn't love me? No, that's definitely not. He communicates his love differently. He is an excellent provider. He loves to, he's very much an acts of service person. He loves to help me by, you know, doing the dishes or doing the laundry or taking out the trash or taking care of the home, like things that, that, that is how he communicates love. He loves to be, he loves to provide and he loves to support in ways that are not emotional and like, it's just not his way. Like I need to be respectful of his and, and honor his way of communicating and not force him to be somebody he's not. And that was just, that was, I had to sit with that, Heather. I had mm -hmm. to sit with that, you know? You know, I think as a spouse, uh, two of the most stressful feelings I have experienced, and I've never experienced them in this, this, this deep way, are the powerlessness and the helplessness that at you and me as a spouse experiences. And I know those are the two same feelings that survivors struggle with. So I find it interesting that many of the things that spouses or that survivors feel, we as the spouses and partners also feel. And power, feeling powerless to change, how, to change the trauma, it's, incredibly difficult and feeling helpless to do anything when you know when there's a trigger happening a flashback and I can't do anything about it I cannot it must sometimes it just must run its course and you know accepting that getting being mindful in that practicing just being with that is incredibly difficult and I think you know one thing I said this on the chat today was spouses and partners must go on their own journey and yeah that that and, was really really key and Sue and, yeah. even just re-mentioned that today like it's super important shiny blue dress on Twitter yes I guys. saw that yeah yeah like I mean that's so important um maybe just briefly wrap that up and tie a bow on it because that is super key for, and I know we mentioned that in the one page, so that'll be good. If you want access to the one page of tonight's video and you don't have time to sit through the conversation, go to one of our websites, traumarecoveryuniversity.com, nomoreshameproject.com, find a tab that says downloadables, look for the downloadable that's titled spouses and partners. And print that out, share that, save that, make a booklet, whatever it is you want to do, make a paper airplane. It's all for you. It's free. It's never cost anything. But Heather, could you speak to that for just another moment? And sure. then I have, um, yeah. I have some other questions that have come in as well. I almost hate to say this because I feel like, oh, like as a spouse or partner, you're like, what? One more thing on my plate. I got to go on my own internal journey. What are you talking about? Like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, like, shh. Crap. My husband doesn't think that he has a journey like this. That's not something that he has grasped yet because his life was perfect until I came along. Like oh dear. his childhood was, oh dear is right. His childhood was perfect. And so therefore he cannot relate and he doesn't have a journey. He lives in a beautiful, beautiful place. Can I visit there? <laughs> oh, I'm sure you've been there. It's called denial. 
Um, but I have. I actually don't like being there. Um, yeah, I don't. It's either, so unhealthy. It is unhealthy because I like to deal with things. But but honestly, he doesn't realize that that's where he is. He honestly, truly, like he's a very truthful, honest man, and he believes that there's nothing for him to process. There's not like, and I'm like, being married to me is traumatic. <laughs> I am traumatizing for you. Like yeah, you yeah. are traumatized because I have traumatized you. Like even if that's the only thing that you yeah. go on a journey for, like, come <laughs> on, really work with me. Like, but I don't know. It's just, uh, I, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And yeah, I just yeah. can't, I can't go down that road for him. Um, I, I have some other questions here yeah, for you. If that's okay. Mm hmm. Um, oh, Lizzie, let us know if that if that was helpful for you. Um, JJ, super happy to be here. We're happy to have you here, JJ. Um, oh my goodness. Oh, JJ says I feel super bad. I just feel bad asking him to do the research, even though he wouldn't say no. He's already been the rock, and he's done so much. Um, I feel the same way, JJ. I feel the same. Um, Heather, while I find this other question, um, would you speak to that? Like if your husband actually communicated and Eden says, I think I need you to research this. Like I'm in a situation where I'm the one who does all the research. I'm the one digging. I'm the one who wants to heal. I'm the one that's on the journey. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. my husband doesn't, if, if I didn't hand him that book, Mm -hmm. And like, like wrap it in a bow and just like with tears in my eyes say it would mean the world to me if you would please read this so you can understand that I'm not just making shit up. Right. Like, like I, I, I resonate strongly with what JJ says and that she just feels bad asking because even though he's not going to say no, he's already been the rock and he's done so much. Can you speak to that briefly while I find these other questions? Mm -hmm. I think I can relate to that in terms of um, not so much reading and research because I actually love to do that, but you know, being involved in my in extra therapy appointments, you know, having to make myself available to go to appointments is probably my I'll call it my sore point. Um, you know, I think there's a balance there because I recognize that if I go to, you know, I'm involved in my husband's therapy. I, that's a choice we've made because it's it's beneficial. Um, however, I have said I'm not going every week. I cannot take the time to do that. But I can go on, I can go this week. I can do this. You know, you as the partner spouse can say, you know what, I see that's important and I recognize this is an important piece of information for me to learn about. I can't do that right now, but I'm off work over the holidays. I'm going to take the time to read it. Or, you know, could you point me to, maybe could you point me to something that's not so long? Um, could we sit down together and go through parts of it? Like Derek and I just went through something to, I actually asked him if we could sit together and go through, it was something on the internet. I said, could you sit with me and I want to understand this. Could you, could we go through this blog article and can you tell me what strikes you Derek about this article because I want to understand this that took us 10 minutes and I got a lot of really good information about it it doesn't have to be long you can give your spouse partner you know options when does it work in their schedule you know letting your spouse the survivors letting your spouse know how much you appreciate them and how much they're giving is a gift and I can tell you that validation alone will make them like, sure, honey, if if that's what you need. You know, I, I think where I've struggled is because of the trauma and the interference of the trauma, I off, I, I've sometimes felt, you know, not validated or not acknowledged. And it's really important to get that. It's important for spouses and partners to be validated that their journey's hard and that the, the extra work that they're doing is, is really valuable. Thank you so much, Heather, for talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, 
I do think that mentioning that is is a, you know a big deal. Um, I'm going to rapid fire real quick. Just share with you some yep. comments. Mm -hmm. um, Sue says, my husband and I had couples counseling to help us cope better and understand each other and move forward together. And that's, I just told her that's amazing. That's awesome. That's what you were just talking about. JG Garcia Martinez says, I find it helpful when I specifically ask for what I need from my hubby. I need your patience, your love and understanding. And I was saying definitely like that is communicating my needs clearly is something that I'm getting better at doing mm -hmm. and I'm loving the response. Um, um, the, the, uh, let's see, there was a question here or there was a um, comment here. Oh, Grace Hope says, I'm very private. I don't want to share my battles with my husband or with anyone. I want to be strong. My shame is so deep, it scares me. What would you say to the survivor who has a non-survivor spouse and she doesn't want to share her battle um, because she wants to be strong and her shame runs so deep? I, I, I'm going to bow out of this one. I, I, want to, I want to defer to your expert opinion because you're the non-surviving spouse of a survivor. You're the non-survivor spouse. Yes, yeah. Um, you know, as the spouse, making sure that this, that you, I think understanding shame, and I'll be honest, I, I, I cannot relate to survivor shame. Um, I mean, I've worked through shame on, on other areas, but I think this is such a big issue that, you know, it's really hard for non-survivors to relate to it. Um, you know, letting the survivor um, know of your love and support is important. I would also say, though, in response to this question that, you know, if not sharing or, or disclosing some of your struggles is affecting the way you relate to your spouse and causing a lot of interrelational issues, um, I would be concerned about that. Because often from my experience and reading and research is, you know, what's on the surface is not the real issue. It's what's going on below the surface. And if that's not being talked about, you know, I, I don't, I think it's, it can be really difficult for the spouse. So I think I would continue, I would say to this person, Grace, I think, you know, continue to work on your issues and to the spouse, um, you know, if you need to get help as you're walking through this and make sure that you you seek out proper support for yourself because it's a long process it is well said heather very well said you. you're welcome um how would you tell a significant other about the abuse and how would you know when you can tell them that's from alexandria shoop on youtube <sighs> And I have a slew of other questions as well. Okay, I'll, I'll try and do this in two sentences. No, I, would gauge... I, don't mean, I don't mean to pressure you. I'm sorry. No, no, there's no pressure. No pressure. I want to answer them as, much, as best I can. Um, again, gauging, you know, your safety. How are you feeling? How safe are you feeling? What kind of relationship is it? Is it marriage? Is it, you know, where are you at in the relationship? Um, all these are factors that need to be taken into consideration. I do believe that at some point disclosure is important. I think providing information to the significant other at that point about trauma and about the effects of trauma could also be helpful. Um, you know, I, I think they're, you know, safety first, but also working towards having an honest discussion, providing the other with information would be my suggestions on that one. Yeah, I would tend to agree. Um, I think gauging, just you're the, you're the expert in the relationship because you're in the relationship. And mm -hmm. so for you to be able to gauge um, 
when is a good time. Like for instance, when I have a conversation, Alexandria, with my husband, I know that what I normally will say is, hey, later on um, this evening or whenever is best for you, would it be okay if we sat down? I really, I need to have um, a discussion with you and I really want your full attention so that I, right. can, so that I can feel fully heard. Because if my husband knows that if, that if he is not fully present with me and, and I'm not feeling heard, that that's one of my biggest triggers. That in the post office. I know, weird, but um, yeah, <laughs> that's a whole nother rant, but um, I, if I'm not feeling fully heard, it's a huge trigger because no matter when I tried to speak up when I was a child about my abuse, um, nobody listened. So now if I'm not feeling fully heard, even if my husband is listening, but he's kind of like off somewhere else and dudes listen to one another while they're looking in opposite directions and females really <laughs> just do this, you know, like you don't see guys going, yeah, I mean, totally. And like, you know, having eye contact, like dudes are like, yep. And they're looking that way and the other dudes looking that way. And the body language is like way off, you know, like they're just like, I am so not in a conversation with this person right now. Like I'm facing this way and he's facing that way. And that's completely normal. And like, and so I'm like, I have to remind him in like a very respectful wife sort of way. Like, hello, not a dude, <laughs> not a dude, not a dude over here. Like wife, like I just need you in wife mode just for a minute, you know? Um, but. Yeah, Alexandria, I think you are the expert in the relationship because you're in it. And so just being able to gauge when is right, like to ask those questions or to and like like plan ahead and make sure that it's not like if you guys are on your way to a social engagement, make sure it's in it. Like if you're going to sometimes we have the ugly cry. If I'm going to have the ugly cry and I think if the ugly cry is possible, then I don't have like a deep conversation with my husband when I know we have to be somewhere. I want to have like as much time as I need to get rid of the ugly cry because there's like the puppy eyes and then, you know, I mean, come on, like anybody that's a girl knows what I'm talking about right now. Um, Heather, you, you understand the <laughs> ugly cry, right? I mean, I really do. Okay, good. Um, question, Heather, super quick. Yeah. Are you, do you have extensive expertise in the areas of personality disorders? Are you? <laughs> no. Okay. Just wondering. No. Um, well, I have, because I have a question here. Uh, well, first of all, Cha-Cha Marquez says, I asked my boyfriend to watch tonight's show with me, but so that he has, so that he would better understand. And I feel like it in one ear and out, it went in one ear and out the other. So here I am watching alone while he watches TV in the living room. Sad face. Cha-Cha, I'm really sorry. I'm not passing judgment on your boyfriend because I don't know him. Um, don't give up on him. Perhaps find a way to like communicate with him like, hey, remember the time I asked you if you would watch this with me and kind of would you know, mean the world to me. Like um, it really broke my heart that you didn't come watch with me. Like it would mean a lot to me. Heather, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. And then I have another. Uh, my thought on that is I, I don't think it's about, and I'm sorry, I forget the name of the person that's tweeting this. Oh, but um, Cha Cha Marquez. Cha Cha. I don't think it's about you. I think your boyfriend is triggered because guess what? We non-survivor folks have our own triggers and they are, they're things that push our buttons and they're from our past and, you know, things that might feel like shut down rejection to you. I often think that they're not about you. They're about the partner or spouse and this is why I'm always like you need to go on your own journey because you need to understand your own internal world and if you understand your internal world you will not react and cause hurt in the relationship and so I, I really that's maybe one of my top things that I say go on your own journey understand your triggers become aware uh, learn how to to be with your triggers and not respond out of them. We all have triggers, yeah. survivors and non-survivors. And it's not just people who live with, with post-traumatic stress disorder that have no. triggers. Like, everybody has triggers. Yeah, and but not everybody um, has a word for them. Like, um, not everybody understands that that's what they are. Like, my husband will say something, or he'll say, um, 
he'll say, I tend to get defensive when I feel like I'm backed into a corner. Okay. What that means to Athena is I get triggered when you start sharing emotional things with me. When you get all like that, mm -hmm. I retreat into my cave. That's yep. what that means. Like, I don't realize that I'm causing my husband to feel like he's backed into a corner because I'm all like in rar Athena mama bear mode over my own stuff. And like, he thinks it's angry. He thinks it's aimed at him, but it's not. I'm actually getting angry on my behalf and finding and accessing my anger for one of the first times in my life. I was, I never even was able to access my anger. It was, I wasn't angry. My, mm -hmm, my counselor mm -hmm. would say, she would give me the pillow to scream into. I was supposed <laughs> to hit things, the safe, the safe pillow that you're supposed to hit. And I, I was supposed to like get angry and like raise my voice into scream into the screaming pillow. And I was just like, I went through the motions just to like appease yep. this poor woman. But I was like, <laughs> girl, it's just not there. Like, I just don't have any anger. I, I went from talking about my abuse and I moved to immediate compassion. My immediate instant response was, well, you don't understand. My abuser had a really horrible childhood and she went from foster home to foster home and she mm -hmm. didn't have a good upbringing. And, you know, she had a really rough time. And so she didn't know how to be, um, you know, a good like person. And, it, it, and so I would immediately make excuses, which is exactly what abuse survivors do to their, with their abusers. <laughs> Like if you're talking to a domestic violence survivor, which hello, I'm one of those too. It's like, he didn't mean it. He's not going to ever do it again. He was just drunk. He was just tired. He was just in a hurry. He didn't, he says he's never going to do it again. He really does love me. He didn't really hit me with a closed fist. It was only a shove. He only spit on me. He only raised his voice. He only cussed at me. He didn't punch me really hard. Like, I mean, I've, I've said all those things. Hello. Oh my gosh. It's like the same thing as me saying, but, but my abuser had a really rough childhood. You don't understand her situation. I didn't have anger. So finally I get a chance to access my anger and I'm finally sharing it with my husband. Like, can you believe this? And he's like, whoa, mm -mm. <laughs> wait, whoa, whoa, wait. I, I get really defensive when I feel like I'm being backed into a corner and I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't, no, no defense, no defensive. Like, this is not, like, I'm upset with you. I'm, like, sharing passionately with you, like, something that I've never been able to share before. And he's like, yeah, it doesn't feel that way, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's just, it's hard. It's really, 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 really hard to know how to share with the person. I guess that we're wrapping up Alexandria's comment, like, knowing when to share and how to share is something that only you will know in the relationship because you're the expert of your own relationship because you're the one that's in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that sounds like such a like bleh answer, like, yeah, whatever. But um, I don't know, like that's, that's my answer. And then Heather gave her answer. Um, the reason I asked if you were an expert in personality disorders or if you had extensive knowledge of personality disorders <laughs> is um, Gloria says, how can I help a man who adopted a narcissistic personality disorder as a coping mechanism and now is emotionally immature? Gloria Aquino. I have been studying um, narcissistic abuse and malignant narcissistic traits and very pronounced narcissistic traits and NPD and narcissistic parents and dark tetrad and dark triad and Machiavellianism and um, cluster B. I've been studying all of this for um, about two and a half years now. And I don't want to say that there's no hope. But what I will say is that you cannot help this man. He needs to want help himself. And a lot of times if someone is malignantly narcissistic, they don't know that they need help. So. Um, Gloria, I want to lovingly say to you that you deserve to care about you and you deserve to put your needs as a priority. And if this person has a narcissistic personality disorder and you are a source of narcissistic supply or you are a scapegoat mm. in this relationship, 
I need to lovingly tell you to protect yourself and to get educated. And if you have not done so, please go subscribe to Richard Grannon, the Spartan Life Coach YouTube channel and binge watch all of his videos. And that's a strong request. Um, specifically the ones about narcissistic personality disorder, NPD, narcissistic abuse, the 20 signs that you're in a narcissistic relationship. Um, there are even videos on his channel that say like, what do I do? Like, can, how can I help this person? He would be an expert in this area. I would not consider myself an expert on relational narcissistic personality disorder. I would consider myself more of an expert on narcissistic parental abuse. Um, seeing how I've dealt with it for 43 years and studied it and have a deep understanding of the parental side of narcissistic abuse. Um, I would reach out to Brie Bonche, Gloria. Gloria, um, Matt, if you could please let Gloria Aquino know that I'm telling her to reach out to Brie Bonche. Um, you can find her at relationshippedia.me or you can find her on um, Facebook at facebook.com forward slash narcopath. We actually, Gloria Aquino, we have, I have a private secret Facebook group specifically for people who are survivors of narcissistic abuse. And you are welcome to be in that group. And you will get a wealth of knowledge. But go um, sign up for Bree's um, blog, relationshippedia.me. And go to facebook.com forward slash narcopath. Go to facebook.com forward slash narc diaries. And message and let, let us know you want to get into a group. And you're not alone. And I would love for you to take care of yourself and not worry about helping this person. Because they have to help themselves first. And I hope that's coming out in the loving way that I intend for it to. Um, let's see. Um, we answered that question and that question and that one. Wow. We did good. Um, there's, um, hey, they like my jacket. It's very stylish. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, oh, Heather, regarding, um, denial and all of that, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize they were brought up in a dysfunctional family. They think mm -hmm. that their family was perfect. Like, because there wasn't abuse that was overt, they think that it was perfect. Um, but, but they just, they don't understand. So they are in denial. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, Gloria says, I love him, but I had to leave because he was very cruel and abusive. I feared for my life. Gloria, thank you so much for sharing that. Yes, yes, yes. Please, please, please protect yourself. Um, Nina, Heather, Nina says, my spouse says he'd rather not talk about the actual abuse itself because he doesn't want to talk about those type of things. He is OCD, and if he gets focused on those types of subjects, he begins to obsess. How should I go about telling him what I am going through? Hmm. Um. Oh, I think we need to know if Nina is a survivor and her spouse is a survivor because I have a list of of um, best practices from Jack and Simi from being married for 18 years for survivor yeah, survivor marriages. I think I need to know that, Nina, before I can answer the question. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I'm trying to monitor Twitter, y'all, but it's hard to do. It's hard um, right now. Um, you know what I would love to do right now, Heather? What I think would be mm -hmm. a smart thing for us to do is I think it would be really, really great for me to share the one page. Yep. And this might be a, a good opportunity if you want to just take a rest, have some water, um, breathe, or if you want to say hi to your fans on Twitter that are all getting to know you and sending you love notes and thanks and <laughs> confetti, and they're just as grateful for you as I am for being here Thank and you. filling in. And I just appreciate you being our, our guest expert. Well, thank you. Person. <laughs> okay, so I will check Twitter um, and take water. Awesome. <laughs> um, you guys, no, Simi, Simi, you did not miss the one page. I am, um, I am, I'm going, I'm going to do it right now. And and I have the one page. 
And then I also have a separate page that is a screen share of best practices um, that I didn't turn into a one page yet, which I probably should. Um, but I have a separate screen share for survivor survivor marriages. That's not like this. The one I'm going to share on the one page is for spouses of survivors. And then the one that Jack and Simi shared that I have is for if both spouses are survivors. So this is for you guys. Um, either way, I'm sure you'll figure out which one is which. And I'm so excited to share this with you. Here we go. Let me know if you all can see it. Um, or maybe if Heather could let me know also if you guys. Oops. Wait. Yeah, it's there, Athena. Oh, uh oh. I just. Whoops. Um, I, I stopped. <laughs> oh, let, me, let me do it again. Bobby does this normally. We have our own little areas of expertise. <laughs> okay, here goes. Is that there? Um, can you see that okay, Heather? Yeah, it looks good, clear. Awesome. Okay. Um, I'm trying to locate the one that I had that is bigger. Um, is it still there? Mm hmm It yep. is. It, Just it not the whole thing. Does it move when I go like this? Is it moving? No. No. It's not. It's not moving. No. Okay. Um. I need to make sure that I'm sharing the right one because otherwise I won't be able to read it and I need everybody to be able to read it. Um, Athena, uh, can I just mention something while you're figuring that out? Of course, yes, absolutely. Okay, it was just a thought um, at the end of or one of the last questions regarding um, the boyfriend that wasn't comfortable watching tonight and he was hanging out watching TV elsewhere. Oh, that was um, Cha Cha Marquez. Yes. Okay, Cha Cha, hi. I'm just sort of a, another thought I had on, you know, as survivors, understanding that your partners will also have triggers and their own, their own inner stuff, right? And so one of the things, one of the suggestion I have is, you know, you don't have to use the word triggers. You know, you could take the time, not when he's watching TV, mind you, but another time and sit down and say, you know, is it, is it possible that the subject matter is making you uncomfortable? Um, you know, there's different ways of phrasing questions to engage in a discussion. You know, maybe you know, you don't know what's in someone's past, even if you're in an intimate relationship. So saying things like, you know, is it possible this is making you uncomfortable? You know, I really want to know what's, what you're thinking, what you're feeling. It's not my intention to upset you. Um, you know, it's just really important that, that we connect and this relationship is really important to me. These are things that the survivor could say to the spouse or partner to engage them in conversation. And, you know, in the same way that survivors don't want to be pushed, also spouses or partners don't want to be pushed. But I think kind of edging at it little by little can, you know, eventually open up for, for deeper discussions. So that was just a thought I had in terms of, you know, rephrasing questions, don't use the word triggers, you know, just kind of coming at it very slowly and gently. <clears throat> mm. Okay. I, yeah. Thank you so much, Heather. Yeah. Um, I, that also, I think, helps with Nina. Nina had a question Mm -hmm. My spouse says he'd rather not talk about the abuse itself because he doesn't want to talk about those types of things. Mm. He's OCD, and if he gets focused on those types of subjects, he begins to obsess. How should I go about telling him what I'm going through? Um, that, was, that was the one where I said, I think right. I need to know if Nina, 
But that all that advice that you just gave right now, I think, is helpful in both cases, whether yeah, they're a survivor I, or not. You know. And in the case of, I actually do know quite a bit about OCD. I I have two years of a psych nursing degree, um, so I have some background in this. Um, you know, that in itself is a mental health issue. And, you know, I would hope that the spouse with the OCD would, would be getting appropriate treatment and support because that really does complicate things. It does. Um, you know, I would, I would encourage that the two of you, you know, both get your own professional support for your mental health issues and, and, and inform the mental health professionals about about the uniqueness of your situation because it is unique um, and, and uh, this takes it to an even more complex level so you know again I would just encourage you guys to really get professional support that you need um, to be able to navigate this because it, it is it is unique yeah no I I would agree um, and OCD does complicate things and mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the the helping professional that you are reaching out to Nina is someone who's trauma informed is not and is not going to try and pathologize right everything because um, it just tends to complicate the issue and and causes both people the spouse and the partner to feel invalidated um yeah I'm going to go ahead now, um, Heather, and I'm going to I'm going to read through the one page. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, you guys. So I have this one page here, and then I have a second one that I will share from Jack and Simi, who have been married for 18 years, and that is in the event you are a survivor. I know that Dawn Hendrick Hendrickson uh, and her husband are both survivors as well. So um, I know that. Sometimes survivors are married to other sur survivors, but in this particular case, in um, on this one page that we're sharing, oh, this is the um, validation one page. This is not the one that I wanted. Whoops. Um, sorry, guys. Wow. Um, I wonder if this is it. Hey, here we go. It's partners and spouses one page. Okay, Athena finally gets it right. Not a word of this to Bobby, you hear? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> she already knows I'm fumbling my way through this. It was, she's like, Athena, I want you to have support while I'm gone. <laughs> I want you to have support while I'm gone. Okay, I'm like, okay. Um, we love you, Athena. <laughs> I, I'm good at my parts, and Bobby is great at her parts. And, you know, together we, we handle this thing and we rock it like a boss. But, you know, when I'm, over here doing my job and Bobby's job, and then I have you as my lovely co-host. It's like, okay, guys, come on. Let's come along for the ride, okay? Okay, here we go. I'm really doing it this time, okay? Partners and spouses, one page, and then we'll share um, what, um, what Jack and Simi had to say to spouses who are also survivors. So being the partner, I'm reading this because a lot of our um, – People that are tuning in, might some of them might be driving. We get people that are driving in the car mm -hmm. listening to us in the background. And so it's not safe for them to read. So if you're tuning in on a podcast, don't forget that you can also have complimentary access to this one-page downloadable resource and to all of our downloadable resources by going to one of our websites and clicking on downloadables. That's nomoreshameproject.com or traumarecoveryuniversity.com. Look for the tab that says downloadables and you can get complimentary access. So I'm going to read through it now for partners and spouses. This is a one page. Being the partner or spouse of a childhood abuse survivor is challenging. You will experience a wide range of emotions, thoughts, questions, and challenges as you journey the recovery road of child abuse with your partner or spouse. You're in a unique position because you are in the most intimate of relationships with a survivor. Initially, initially you may feel shock anger, and deep sadness at the disclosure of past abuse by your partner or spouse. You may feel guilty. You miss the signs. You may have questions like, why didn't he or she disclose this before? Why didn't she remember the abuse? Will he ever fully recover? Or what will happen to me? These are normal feelings and valid questions. 
As you and the survivor begin to understand the damage done by childhood abuse, you may find yourself thinking about the past. Perhaps there are areas of relational frustration which begin to make sense. Perhaps there were out of character behaviors and responses which you can now connect to your partner's abuse history. These connections bring relief, but they can also trigger hopelessness. Will the survivor be able to heal? As the partner or spouse, you may have to take on greater responsibility for daily tasks, including parenting, employment, household maintenance, and more. You may also face the daunting task of setting boundaries with individuals or family members who you now recognize as unhealthy or unsafe. You may feel lonely at times. If your partner or spouse is debilitated by the trauma, he or she may no longer enjoy the activities you once did together. If the survivor is withdrawn and isolates, your outside relationships may also be affected. Partners, spouses, and children are at risk for mental health issues as well. Vicarious or secondary trauma may occur from the exposure to the ongoing trauma of the survivor. Hearing stories and witnessing the effect of your partner are very difficult. Partners and spouses are at risk for compassion fatigue and caregiver burnout due to the ongoing stress. So I'm moving down here to the pink lettering. As a partner and spouse, please consider the following tips and strategies. And I just, again, want to let you guys know, you know, any feelings that you might be having are natural. And I, I want to encourage you, regardless of whether or not you're a spouse or a survivor, please do your best not to shame yourself or should yourself all over the place when you feel certain ways. Feelings are feelings. They're not right or wrong. They are just how you feel. So I'm going to move here to bullet point number one. Recognize your feelings, needs, and goals are important. You matter. Do not stuff your feelings and thoughts away or sweep them under the rug. Bullet point number two, educate yourself about childhood abuse. Familiarize yourself with terminologies such as attachment, self-regulation, dissociation, trauma-informed, trauma responses, etc. Bullet point number three, understand there is a physiological brain injury when a survivor has been exposed to ongoing abuse. Although the most common term used is PTSD, the correct term is developmental trauma disorder. Become, bullet point number four, become self-aware. It is important that partners and spouses work at their own, work at their own unresolved past issues as these may be triggered by situations with their survivor. Learning to respond to the present without the fuel of the past contributes to your mental health and diffuses stressful situations. That is such a powerful sentence, it bears repeating. Learning to respond to the present without the fuel of the past contributes to your mental health and diffuses stressful situations. This is so key, oh my goodness. Bullet point number five, recognize your own limits. You cannot be all things to your partner or spouse. Learn to set healthy boundaries. Bullet point number six, go with your spouse or partner to their therapy appointments. You may be able to provide valuable information to the therapist. Bullet point number seven, keep crisis line numbers, therapists, doctors, and other important contacts in a readily accessible place. Bullet point number eight, do not feel ashamed if you, as the partner or spouse, require medications for depression, anxiety, or sleep. Discuss your situation with your doctor. Bullet point number nine, if you feel a situation with your partner or spouse is becoming abusive or unmanageable, make arrangements to separate until stability is attained. Bullet point number 10, do what you need to do to stay healthy. Practice self-care. Pare down your schedule and prioritize. Bullet point number 11, 
When a survivor is responding out of a trauma state, there may be nothing you can do to change that. Stepping away from the situation, deep breathing, and settling your nervous system will keep you healthy. Bullet point number 12, with the input of your partner or spouse, find ways to communicate to diffuse stressful situations. For example, asking open-ended questions like, is it possible you are triggered? Provides choices for the survivor which lead to improved, healthy communication. Before I move on to bullet point number 13, I just want to recommend something with regards to bullet point number 12, and I didn't have room to type it all out, which is why I'm just mentioning it as an aside. When asking a question to your survivor, is it possible you are triggered? I think it's important your survivor already has an understanding that you are not minimizing their, their abuse. I think it's important that your survivor know that if you're asking a question such as, is it possible you are triggered? It's not that you're exasperated with them or it's mm -hmm. the band-aid or the end all be all or the catch all for like, oh, I'm being really unkind to you right now. So what I'll do is I'll just throw it back on you and say, isn't it possible that you're triggered right now? This is all on you, this is your fault. Like making sure that you're having a a healthy conversation and that your survivor knows that you understand what the word triggered means and that you're not minimizing mm. their trauma. Would, and you, would you agree? Yeah. And that's, that's why that's I why preface, I preface, preface that, that by saying, by saying with, with the input in. of your partner, spouse, find ways to communicate to diffuse stressful situations. That is that is un that question is under the assumption that the two of you have sat down and had a present healthy community you know uh interaction discussion about what is what is the best way to deal with with situations so that's why i prefaced it with that so i yeah. agree with you with athena it's not don't take that out of context because you need to read the first sentence Absolutely. Thank you so much for clarifying, Heather. I know um, I'm a person that's that's married to a non-survivor, and so if he were to say out of nowhere, like, aren't you just triggered, or is it possible that you're triggered, I'd be like, wait a second, buddy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You've never even used that word before. Now you're like, <laughs> wait a second. Like, that would not go over well. <laughs> right. My poor husband. Um, okay, bullet point number. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Bullet point number 13, seek out support and healthy connections. Friends, therapists, support groups, online groups, it is important you continue reaching out to safe people, even if your survivor partner is unable. Yeah. Bullet point number 14, take small steps. Do what you can when you can. Bullet point number 15, Above all, be kind, gentle, and compassionate to yourself. You are worth it. Um, it is important for even all of us as survivors um, to occasionally, I make sure that at least once a day, I let my husband know that I appreciate him. And I don't just like say it really quick, like, oh, by the way, I appreciate you. Like, I take a moment, usually once a day, just to let him know. And I'm not saying every single day you need to put on your to-do list to thank your partner, but... Uh, I think a little bit of appreciation goes a long way mm -hmm. when we're dealing with a spouse that is um, learning and navigating this thing for the first time ever, especially if they're not a survivor. Um, yeah. I know that just, I don't know, Heather, you're a non-survivor partner. Um, you're, mm -hmm. you, are, you have not been sexually abused as a child, and you're a partner, spouse of a sexual abuse survivor. Um, like I will occasionally send my husband just a random text message or an email or a little card or a little handwritten note or something that just says, you know, I really appreciate your love and your compassion and the, and mm. you um, caring enough to to read that book or to to check in on me. Yeah, that's really good. That's very important. Thank you. Yeah, I I think just. A little bit of appreciation goes a long way yeah. towards our towards our partners, you guys. And lastly, of course, it's always our last bullet point on these one pages for the past year or two, and that is encourage your survivor partner or your survivor partner.
slash spouse to join in the community. Um, and what I meant to say is encourage your survivor. Like if you're the partner or spouse, <laughs> that's what I meant. If you are the partner or spouse of a survivor, encourage them to join in safe community with other survivors to receive the support and encouragement they need. You do not need to be their savior. You are not their Jesus. You are not their everything. They're all in all, their end all be all, their only source of support. You cannot, as we mentioned earlier, in this one page and in some of the, the Q&A portion of this video, you cannot be everything to your survivor. You just can't. You will burn out and you mm -hmm. will experience compassion fatigue and, 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 and the like. So please encourage your survivor spouse to get plugged in. There's strength in numbers. Being in community with other survivors who have lived their pain will help them to feel stronger and less ashamed. We have free organized virtual safe support communities where your survivor, spouse or partner can practice new skills and become adept at creating healthy habits. Ask us about getting plugged into a free online support group for survivors by clicking here. And if you are, if you log on to nomoreshameproject.com or traumarecoveryuniversity.com and you click right here on that link, it's a PDF and it will take you to an easy four-step process on how to get plugged into safe community. And if you just follow it line by line by line, the easy four steps, it, boom. I mean, usually within a week or two, we can get you plugged in. Again, we're not set up for crisis support. This is like a long-term. I have, We have people that have been in our groups for two years-ish or more. So um, please, please, please don't, don't hesitate. Reach out. Um, and get plugged in to safe community if you are a survivor. And if you're the spouse of a survivor, go to nomoreshameproject.com or traumarecoveryuniversity.com and look for this one page that's titled um, Partners and Spouses and go down and click or any any of the resources that you find. It's, they're all free. Just click down on that bottom bullet point on that link and it will tell your survivor spouse how to get plugged into an online support group that is private and secret and safe and they can even do it anonymously. If you wish to get plugged in anonymously on Facebook, what you'll do is you'll go over to Facebook and you will create an anonymous profile that is not your normal profile and then you will click on that link and then you will follow the four-step process on how to get plugged into safe community. Um, we really don't want you suffering alone. You're not alone. Um, statistically speaking, there are 1 billion of us. I know that's a huge number and it's really hard to swallow, but there are 7.6 billion people on the planet and one in four girls, one in six boys, do the math. There are statistically 1 billion of us survivors who have been sexually abused before our 18th birthday and there is support. You're not alone. You do not have to struggle alone. There are so many of us healing in safe community together. We have um, almost 2,000 YouTube subscribers YouTube subscribers on this channel. We have almost as many Roku TV um, viewers who are watching us on a Roku device or a Roku television. We have several hundred of you healing in safe support groups in different groups of different genres of abuse. And we have almost 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. Um, 100,000 people or a hundred however many thousand of you have clicked the view button and watched a video a hundred thousand times and that and we've only had our channel for two and a half years mm -hmm. so um, there are a lot of us you're not alone so um, I just want to encourage you to get plugged in and I wanted to share briefly really quick Heather do you have a few moments to stick around yep awesome I wanted to share um, a, a real quick, I'm going to turn this into another one page if I can here. Um, this is advice for both spouse, um, advice for when both spouses are survivors. Um, and I will turn this into like a, a separate one page and, and so that you guys can have access to this as well. And this is advice given us, given to us by, um, our community members who have been here um, since right around the very beginning for about two and a half years. And here we go. Okay, so on Twitter, at Jack Lumen, 
and at Wave Mistress. This is what to do when both spouses are survivors. Bullet point number one, during an argument, as soon as you can, pause and realize that your partner may be triggered or their trauma may be informing their word choice. Bullet point number two, and this could go for even if the, I think, even if the spouse isn't a survivor, I think some of the things that are listed here are very much like um, relational best practices. In my opinion, I thought these were excellent best practices. Bullet point number two, let your spouse become a vital part of your recovery journey. You've chosen to walk this road together as often as possible. Do it hand in hand. However, bullet point number three, when you are triggered and your spouse offers to help, accept their help as often as you can. I know as survivors, it's hard for us to accept help sometimes. It's really difficult. Um, as Grace Hope mentioned on Twitter tonight, we, we often want to be strong and we don't want to bother anybody. Um, so try to accept help as often as possible if your spouse is offering to help you. Bullet point number four, talk about your feelings, but be aware their, their own trauma, your spouse's own trauma, may actually prevent them from being able to listen in that particular moment. If this is the case, try to make a promise with each other to talk about things when both of you are calm. I think that goes for even non-survivor spouses as well. Next bullet point, be patient. This can be the most important thing. No journey is without problems. Be patient with each other. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with the process. It takes time, most definitely. And this is a big one, you guys. This is a big one. Avoid discussion of divorce. Survivors often live with abandonment fears from childhood. So save any discussion of the possibility of divorce as an absolute last resort. I know my husband and I, we just sort of have like, like that's not even like divorce isn't in our vocabulary. It's not something that we even like, that's not something that we're, you know, considering we'll we'll go to the ends of the earth to to work through anything that we're going through, but we don't throw the D word around um, as like a passive aggressive move. Like, oh yeah, well that's it. I'm just going to get a divorce. You know, it's almost like the the ace in your the ace up your sleeve or something, or you know, keep that in your back pocket. Like that's not. We sort of took that off the table as a non option. Um, now, don't get me wrong. If there was abuse going on in the marriage, this is this is one caveat to that. If there is abuse going on in the marriage, like if there was overt abuse, if there was emotional, verbal, physical abuse, domestic violence, um, abuse going on in the marriage, then I do advocate for people to step away and separate um, until the abusive partner and the person who is being abused receive the support they need. I don't advocate for anyone staying in a marriage um, regardless of your your faith belief or what have you. If if there's abuse going on, there's there it's not okay for you to stay in an abusive marriage. Um, especially modeling that for your children who will then probably perpetuate the abuse cycle unless they have the wherewithal to, to break the cycle. So yeah. Um, last resort guys. And then last bullet point have separate support systems in place for when you cannot talk with each other. And then this is from Jack and Simi, you guys. Jack usually talks with his father and others, and I usually chat with one of the Facebook trauma support groups. They really help. So um, again, just like a really um, real sort of peek and look at like, getting plugged into safe community as much as you kind of want to like lone ranger it and do it on your own getting plugged into safe community can be really super duper helpful so um heather do you have any parting thoughts for everyone before we say goodbye i just really want to thank you um obviously i have thanked you a lot privately but just publicly thank you so much for having the courage to come on with us we've never had anybody on with us before so thank you for having the courage to just step up and and um, co-host tonight and for sharing your heart do you want to just let everybody know where they can find you on social sure. media and find you on your blog well thank you athena it's been my pleasure um just uh, one parting thought is just you know don't give up on your spouse or partner the non-survivors 
it might take a little longer for uh, for them to come around. I, I I didn't get a chance to share, but you know, I this has been a long journey for me too, and and uh, I just want to encourage you guys to hang on, um, and you know, point your spouses and survivors, uh, spouses and partners to this resource. Uh, you can connect with me on my website at heathertuba.com where I write about um, uh, supports for survivors and their spouses. That's my main message. Uh, you can connect with me on Twitter at heathertuba and on Facebook, which is facebook.com backslash heathertuba. And um, yeah, I just want to encourage you all that there is hope for relationships here. And it, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's also a very, it, it's a rich journey when you go on it. And so um, thanks for having me, Athena. It's been really great. You are so welcome. I'm really grateful that we got an opportunity to share your your heart with our community Thank and mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm um, I'm grateful that your husband Derek has such a fierce advocate <laughs> um, I my husband's <laughs> amazing and he's really trying hard and after five or so years he's finally like reading a book and it's awesome but man like I'm sitting back kind of a little bit envious of your husband that he has such a fierce <laughs> survivor advocate in the corner he he probably like me to, he'd probably like me to simmer down sometimes to be honest as soon as he comes to the door i'm like look what i read today look what i found out today look at this so he's like okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the grass the grass appears greener on the other side you know? yeah like yeah probably wishes you would simmer down and stop doing so much research and i'm kind of like oh my gosh how amazing like I would love it if my husband took some interest in this. This would be because yeah. I think what the thing is is that we as survivors, a lot of us, we first of all, we have never been believed. We've been yep. told that we were liars. The whole world wants us to shut up because no one wants to admit that there's childhood sexual abuse. Like they want to yeah. just pretend it yeah, doesn't culturally. Exist. Culturally, yeah, exactly. And so to have like our spouses, like you, step up and go, oh, I believe you. I believe you, and the reason I believe you isn't be just because you're my husband, and I love no. you, and I know you wouldn't lie to me. I believe you because statistically there are a billion of you out there, and there's not a lot of people that want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> and, you know, I believe you because you deserve to be heard, and I've done all this research, and I'm starting to understand trauma, and, you know, just so I'm so blessed that you have taken the time to come on here and to educate oh, all the spouses out there. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, you guys, we would love to hear from you in the comments section. The section below this video is a great place for you to support one another. I know during the live chat, um, this was a live broadcast that happens every single Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, and you are invited. You're always welcome to come here every single Monday. 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. There's a live chat box on YouTube Live. We also have a Twitter chat going on on the Twitter feed using the hashtag no more shame. We have um, an email account. You can send us um, topic suggestions. No more shame project at gmail.com is a great way to reach out to us. Please go to the about section of our YouTube channel and follow the easy four step process to get plugged into safe community. You're not alone. Please try not, don't, don't try to lone ranger this. Like mm -hmm. there is so much help in safe community and it makes a <clears throat> huge difference for your mental and emotional well-being and all of your interpersonal relationships. If you have a safe outlet of other survivors who get you, when you find someone who gets you, you get a whole community filled with them. Oh my gosh, the shame just melts away. The shame just melts away. You're like, wait, I'm not a freak. I'm not being like you guys all believe me you guys have all lived through what i've lived through what 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 wait a second what like it's just mind-blowing so um you're welcome to join us please please accept our invitation to join us it's free like we're not selling anything you're just welcome to join us and we only accept friendly people we have a zero tolerance policy on abuse and minimization of any kind there's no minimization allowed and no abuse allowed um so just please um, feel free to reach out to us. 
Um, thank you once again to Heather Tuba. Please subscribe to her blog, heathertuba.com. Many thanks to Maggie, our research intern, Matt, who moderated the, the um, YouTube chat box along with Jack and Simi, who gave us great advice for survivor spouses as well, um, when both spouses are survivors. And just all of you, you guys, our community is amazing. You guys are the reason this community is so powerfully healing. So thank you for showing up. Next week, our, our uh, Bobby Parrish will be back from her time in the UK. And I'm just so grateful that you've chosen to spend this time with us. We're about 20 minutes over, so I will be bidding you a very fond farewell. <laughs> I'm Athena Moberg, and this has been Heather Tuba um, on Twitter at Heather Tuba or at HeatherTuba.com. And um, this is Trauma Recovery University, and we love bringing you everything you need for healthy, informed trauma recovery. See you next Monday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.